is um, a major honor. And when I've just said that, um, I find it a weak and ill-adapted formula. I am thrilled, I am impressed, and I am very moved. Um, to have um, poets I have been working with for and now for years, and this um, pleasure, um, happiness, um, something beyond words, or my words at least, I owe to Clément, Xavier, Jim and Steve, and I want to thank you all for organizing this and making it possible. I want to express my gratitude, my respect, my admiration, my affection to um, the amazing poets that have agreed to come together and unite their voices in celebration of Robert Duncan and in celebration of poetry. As you know me well, I tend to go depressed at times and as happy. I'm going to try not to go apocalyptic on this one. <laughs> remind us of our present and poetic times. The times of Duncan and other poets, as we have heard um, time and time again throughout uh, today, were unpoetic times in similar and in different ways. The experience of disaster, exceptional or not, is not exceptional. And the ways poetry copes and deals with the unexceptionality of the human condition, of our human actions, is what has always fascinated me, guided my work, and made me attentive <coughs> to the voices we are going to hear tonight. So I'm not going to um, spend a long time on what is poet's time and speak no more. I'll just say a few words first to introduce uh, my dear friend, Rachel Duplessis. Um, <clears throat> Rachel um, is a poet, as all of you know, editor and scholar. Her interests are in modern and contemporary poetry, especially issues of gender, the long poem, and cultural poetics. She um, was a professor at Temple University for many years and is one of the foremost critics of her generation and her works of scholarship include Writing Beyond the Ending, Narrative Strategies of 20th Century Women Writers in 1985, HD, The Career of That Struggle, which many of us here in this room read uh, very attentively a few years ago. Um, for uh, very practical and um, intellectual reasons. The Pink Guitar Writing is Feminist Practice in 1990, Genders, Races, and re Religious Cultures in Modern American Poetry, 1908-1934, published in 2001. I'm not going to list the very long list <laughs> of uh, Rachel's wonderful books. Um, with um, Peter Quatermain, she co-edited The Objectivist Nexus, Essays in Cultural Poetics. And um, her major work as a poet is the long poem, Drafts, which she began in 1986 and published the final installment of in 2012. Her more recent work includes Interstices, which was published in 2014, Graphic Novella 2015, Oasis Little Red Leaves Textile Editions 2016, Days and Work, and Around the Day in 80 Worlds, which uh, has a wonderful title. That uh, reminds me of something I read when I was younger. Um, the two volumes of her new long poem. So, Rachel. If you apply a little bit too much, we won't have our 10 minutes and we'll be angry. <laughs> no poet should have fewer. This, unfortunately, is a poem written very recently. It was in conjunction 72. It's a serial poem in six parts, and it's very much of our time. It's called Cosmos, a Nocturne. 
one. I began this far away, down near, before dawn, in a night saturated with pitiless derangements, part dreamed, part head blood, part galloping times, capital letter concepts arranged in categories, then scrambled, intercut, spilling counterpart ides. Ill justness, echo f, disust, noxus, aster rage, on wreck. Every abstract noun and inchoate block that struck like a rock gushed a water choke, ready at any odd cell small no sleep image anger to cover the world with mud. Not dreams, not nightmares, it's sludge of political failure, systemic ruptures, looms of dooms on earth. Yet the quiet gate stayed open, the slide into sleep had seemed assured. It was no help being rebar rigid with rage, no particular sense to pit extreme heat, caged children, bottled water litters micro bits against sleep. Yet these things burst, flooded over, further embittering other unstoppable tides. Two, it seems I have no skin, am hungry ghost to haunt the stormed on streets, wading in elements so engulfing and poisonous, I am about to die again. Three, the merger of two black holes forms one binary black hole. Is this really a thing? <laughs> Did I say it right? The person lying flat in awe and fear is not quite sure what this entails, except black holes are rare and somewhere there. Implosive antimatter stuff, the inside out of cosmos, outside in, a heavy dot with which to re-begin. Galactic collision between long zone, bifold, double swishing light year slough. Although the person seems secure that she is, I am here, implacable as astrophysics, though not so impressive, nor as long term, with all the double question, does this count? Does it matter being here? Four. Can this cosmos be trusted with a list of words, daily symbols, nothing abstract, like will or justice? Can it be trusted to accept that nouns like home or night are invested with our feelings? Say, the touch of that particular door, its key to jiggle in a certain way, then a little kick, your home, the light flickers, the leaves get shadowy luminous, and darkened colors shine. The moon is up, the door is shut, the night is full, the world is clear. Can the cosmos bear my picture in the shape of a rooster, flowery, charming, and it turned out impractical? Can it dare the word of mother without evoking something mendable? Can it share our bread? Does the cosmos care to understand house, bread, pitcher, night, door? Five. Yet ferocious mismanagement ensues. A series of if-then clauses follow involving plastics and electronic waste, generating profit, disordering the drinkable, fracking plasma fields of cosmic blood, from which a flood of moral suffering rises above last night's crest. What is to be done? What could or should we do? To live in our world is what I mean. 
And is it relief or infinite sadness to think that this will be destroyed, whether we, insomniac mites, do it or approve or not? Will be absorbed and be transformed in the long-term normal course of things, no matter whether we wake tomorrow or stay awake till light to say, picture, door, house, bread, night. Six. Glints of cosmic green glass pierce our rocks, black glass, azure arrivals, jewels of song, all from drifts of dust. It's cosmic dust. These matter-swirling beauties generate our astonished empathy, considering that all this is innumerable grasps and gasps of cells and minerals hooked into each other's processes, where chancy atoms frisk and frost, setting night and day in motion, where we can see their turns. Does it matter that we can? We see them now. This place, these multiples, this time barely countable, barely accountable with the numbers we possess, it's a fixed, sorry, uh, wish it were, it's an unfixed archive, neither all omnivorous nor all complete, but present as colors, mixed and metamorphic, just like that. Crystals of small light fall from a compromised sky, and once you know what you must face, you try to wake. Okay, now, no poet is going to ever leave two minutes on the table. <laughs> and guaranteed, guaranteeing this, I'm about to read part of a poem, because it's kind of Duncan-y, and I want to do it in honor of Duncan. This is called Bildung's Gedicht with Apple, and uh, it's a poem actually dedicated to my students, two of whom are actually presenting. I mean, this is from a long time ago. Okay, and um, it has to do with vocation and the assumption of vocation um, in the spirit of Duncan, whose um, continuous stance of, voc of, of vocational calling is moving to many of us. Remember, this is the last half of this poem. Plus, there was, couldn't make this up, an apple. A giant apple blocking the view, and therefore the whole range of scales was off. Was it high or low? Could I reach it? Was it far? Unsteady? Now unnarratable? Rotted out? I mean, truly, there was a tree top apple juice label pasted down on the blank page, and on each one were words I once had typed. Apprentice yourself to yourself, said I <coughs> first. And dry up your minimalism, said Apple II, the appeals or appels of the apples. It was certainly <coughs> advice, and after all that time. So without knowing whether things would hold, I entered the area <coughs> that seemed to come from in and out, from back and forth, all sides at once. No matter how, the fold became intent to speak its mobile waft of little X's marking spot of sidewalk, road, and field to say, and this was really all it was, it is, es gibt, si, ji, choe, the rolling floor, the bumpy way, the lunge, the obdurate, and really a hinge. Determined it was to speak in languages, metamorphosing, because in single language, the poem could not be complete, but since it craves a multilingualism that it barely earned, let it fantasize. For then it flew unwrapped and rose in rapture. Then it came to flow amongst its several wilder tongues, floating bolts of uncut cloth that did not care for top or back, but draped and flew and blew like clouds and grew and plunged like waves. Wow.
poet, painter, and translator. Her translation works include Daniel Colbert's journals and Portugal's Nude and Fuad Gabriel Nafai's The Spirit God and the Properties of Nitrogen. She has also edited and translated Crosscut Universe, writing on writing from France in 2000, an anthology of poetry and poetics by contemporary French writers. She is the uh, author of many books of poetry, including Natural Light in 2009, Where Shadows Will, Selected Poems in 2009 as well, Spinoza in Her Youth, 2002, The Vulgar Tongue in 2000, Desire and Its Trouble in 1998. Her experimental work, Scout, a text and image work, was released in 2005, and from 2004 to 2006, Co uh, Norma was the lead artist for collective memory, an installation, performance, and publication for poetry and its art, Bay Area Interactions, 1954 to 2004. Um, she has uh, many awards, including a fellowship from the Foundation for Contemporary Art, and uh, recently published Fake News, actually in November 2018. That's uh, a very short time. Thank you for coming, and thank you for the introduction. I'm going to read first from this old older book where Shelley wrote of the one called Dear Robert. It's my uh, email to Robert uh, 15 or so years after his death. And I was missing him. Dear Robert, I just wanted to check in with you, see what's happening. I was reading your Achilles song, the first poem in Groundwood before the war, in which Jesus promises Achilles not a boat, but the remembrance of a boat. There is always a before the war, isn't there? Some war, another war. Miss you, love Norma. P.S. And back of that war, the deeper unsatisfied the war, And from the new book. First, for Joanne Cutter, Halloween 2. Holy cow! Hope the jack o' lantern doesn't run for President Den, is what we're all thinking these days. <laughs> And now I'm, I'm going to read for a few poems from the last uh, part of this book called Harnologics. That's from Ornette Coleman, and there's a uh, graph from him. What do you expect, Ornette Coleman? <laughs> <laughs> Eat the beans. Now, this is an ethnograph. Now, eat, eating the beans is much like eating the parents' cakes. That's from Slutsk Tark, Moravia. The only thing is the poem is expected to return home, to return to the time. As a child and as a musician, I say to you, a series of substitutions. It's my turn to talk now. I offer this object in disguise as food, a color in the size of a lover. St. A is forever holding out his flaming head. I take your words into my mouth. I am an arrival and a city in which order is not yet established, in which order has not yet been erased. I eat the seal water. A musician's liver is a man's heart on a certain street. Suddenly, this 
pale meat, the naked violinist back to the window as she practices. The impulse to disrupt the reading continuously by some, any short version, a vision of expansion. So they'll post the card, keep, keep it, I am sent. Look for that man in the moon, hesitancies, a dog discovers his color, its source. From sight to mind without the dream in which in rituals of time. Don't eat the heart to that dress. There we were on the spot, lunch on the grass at the site. As you may know, and in the new year, do you like the feeling of what happens in the chamber in the song? Limitation stains as her lover, the second shelf, second guessing, no long time project, missing grass stains. Is it an argument that builds? Don't eat the bad. You really thought about it, not for long. A person's name means, I don't know, because of the coming of those letters, another volume called Outcast Variable. How do you know which is which? In the form of the night watch, is logic of dismemberment various hand and wings. Alba. People make worlds at dawn. People shaped dead of work. Purple cord, brown tile, white tape, shadow. The room smells like fuel, like exhaust. Euchronia, memory under construction. People make rules called fundamental. The night watching, full of promise. She lives it, the object hove to. The instrument serves to reinforce the sound of the voice. A quoi she dreams upon the silent words. He hated hearing the last things. It was the breath, the quantity of the oxygen in the bone, look in the blood, the rhetoric of the blood. It would sense itself directly to the senses. Sugar wings. I've, I have been able to find your keyhole with my eyes shut. John pulls out the flies. Flies singing love songs. There are secret rhythms in the love songs. Some flies are unlucky in love. <laughs> the rhetoric of flies is the pulse. This one, then, in good time, Madge leaves the Leland Hotel, a pebble and a penny on the snow. Fake map referring to the building of the music and trying to reproduce it. Overtones, elegy, that high voice past the midpoint. My free will has a mind of its own. <laughs> Straight trade, Leo wrote, tugging on the fence, a two-ton weight on her line. The house is gone, the hotel is gone. Madge, that is not your brother in the photographs.
Thank you. published by the State University of New York Press in the fall of 2000, and he has two novellas, Marble Snows and The Study, which was published in 2009. His uh, libretto for the Opera Constellations Awakening, based on the life of German Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin, has been set to music by composer <coughs> Ellen Fishman Johnson and performed at the Philadelphia Fringe Festival. Um, this art burning, a multimedia work of poetry, video, and music created in collaboration with Ellen Fishman Johnson, premiered at the Philadelphia Fringe Festival in 2011. Um, his poetry and criticism have appeared in numerous magazines and anthologies. I'm not going to um, list them all. I'd rather um, let my colleague uh, read for you. Is this good? Yeah, that's good. Well, um, when I heard that, uh, when I read that uh, Nathaniel was coming to this uh, event, um, I was reminded of his early translations, uh, I shouldn't say early, but showing me for the first time, his translations of Victor Segalon. Uh, and I've been working on a series of poems based on Singalon's um, Ode Sude de Tibé. Uh, I'm a little nervous about reading this because I was at the translation of, you know, Duncan in Paris today. And of course, what I've done here is really, I don't know, transmogrify, uh, miscegenate, uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, what I've done with. Uh, said a while. I'll just read a little note that sometimes goes. Uh, I've done about 40 of these, and so I'll read the little note that I uh, sometimes accompany these poems with, and then I'll read the poem. And in Sigalon's work, which has fascinated me for years, takes up his own deep interests in Buddhist and Taoist thought at times attempts to suggest the language of the sages whose genius and compassion and knowledge of the illusory self, the implicit subject of this poem, he venerated it. In the spirit of Segalon's mimicry, I've tried in this loose translation, I mean loose, some mimicry of my own. Uh, I think it was uh, in, in the recent um, uh, uh, the recent Wesleyan edition of Stella, uh, the, uh, the, uh, in, the introduction by Hans Simsi said that uh, Segalon translated from a language that never existed into a language that has never existed. <laughs> so, so this is um, a, a long poem of his uh, entitled Ode to the sky on the esplanade of the new, and it's from the Tibet series. And uh, each section um, uh, is headed by a state of mind, or a, you know, the way the Buddhists uh, you know, break up the wheel of life or something else. And uh, oh, by the way, Jerry Rothenberg published this in Poets, poetry blog at some time, so hi guys, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so the first section, doubt. Familiar spirit, if nevertheless this is what you wish to be, a high sovereign, sky lord of the lit temple, one who has spoken embracing the bowl reversed from the air, the majesty of blue, of jade, 
and of iron. Truly, if you are a construct of that which you proclaim, being light of all and everything and one who rises up to and yet remains fixed under the roof of the great void, surrounded like a wall of spiraling ether, profoundly hard and pure. Still, what deprivation, what prostration of the orb's height where my forehead reigns at the resting place of the sages, over the troubled, troubled paving that rounds out their image, what humility belittling my face, what, naked raise, what nakedness raises me toward yours, what unreasonableness growls as though infused with lightning from the lowest places where sifting among the self's particles, I am the mere pivot of the millstone that grinds. Resolution. Is it necessarily thus, beingless one, that you could be not undeceived? Not yourself, the canceling dust collector, not the disappearing, not transparent, knowing, not always confoundingly the lone one of your self vows. Without doubt and without end, evoking your certitude, feigning knowledge, I strike three times at my own demons. I laugh at respect. I glare feverishly toward those at bay. I strongly sound out hope and distress. Without fear, heart exposed, flooded by light and water, I raise with two hands my appeal. I reach out to touch. Manifestly, it is necessary that you appear to me. Your sky is not futilely distant, nor your clarity. See, I await you. I keep the dance to myself, carrying my spirit, calling you for in the world, throwing my weight in reverse, so that the probe, a diver plunging toward vertiginous depths under the ice cap, Contemplation. You are all, all at once, all that you are. Your true essence and your numerous assumptions, your names, your attributes, the world, your world, overwhelms. Contemplation transforms into rapture. You are the Lord of science, a body more light than smoke, thus penetrant, burnished until you are pure spirit and its echoes. You are rich in years, first one, born from chaos. You know how to discern the imbecile from the hero. Glacial, comforter, divine, diviner, one exorbitant, contemplated, contemplator, in all that is animate, in which all returns and dies, heard, numerous, perfume, music and color, double dome and god, temple formed in the vault, triple, hundredfold of the 10,000 ways, worried father of all who are bewitched, your perfect eye profoundly hard and beautiful. Arousal. So beautiful, so perfect in opposition to the human that I am silenced, my words nulled, never attaining to the ninth sphere, nor to the space below, nor to the spirit lords who have fled. Most high, let us walk the ordered esplanade. Let us carry high the numerous and the just whirlwinds. Let us grasp the circle. Let us catch the assailing blue. So high, without hope, there are no rays. To aid here the new embers of our appearance, here the three mountains and the renewing of the hours, recommencing strong interior life. So we must let them blaze. Let us devour flesh and blood. It is necessary to arouse oneself, its fire crackling, to burn red, to penetrate one's heart with the deepest of gouges, to traverse on the vertical fires that the sky stirs, carrying ourselves to the level of the horizon filled with winds. Meditation. Here the self's 
ransom, and the crude meditation, here falls the torrents of rain and of gratitudes, the sky spilling tears on the fullness of me, all abundance, a cataract pummeling me, dizziness weighs down the flesh and the earth's blood, futility of flight so high without lure, vulture frozen in blue, agony without death, to cut the links, not even a giant dares. And then all disposes itself, and then all is closed and gloomy, the yellow taken back. I'm to kneel down, to flatten on my face the master's eyes, the eyes living but without brilliance, the spirit exhausted, the heart too breathless to beat. Truly, he has been what was, sovereign, lord of sky and temple clear who has spoken, the bold reversed in air. This of your majesty, of blue, of jade, and iron. Mm. <laughs> McCaffrey is part of the Canadian avant-garde poetry scene, especially he was in the 1970s, and his creative work has been marked by innovation and a move away from conventional, form, conventional forms. His uh, poetry includes sound poetry as part of the collaborative group of the Four Horsemen with poets Rafael Barreto Rivera, Paul Dutton, and P.P. Nichol, and concrete poetry. His visual poetry is in permanent collections at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, Paul Getty Research Institute in Malibu, the, the International Concrete Poetry Archive in Oxford, England, and the New York Public Library. Um, his uh, poetry includes uh, a number of uh, chapbooks and full-length collections, among them modern readings, poems, 1969-1990, published in 1991, seven pages missing, selected texts, volumes one and two, 2001-2002, verse and worse, selected and new poems, Siv McCaffrey, 1989, 2009. Um, the, uh, with uh, B.B. Nickel, he edited Sound Poetry a Catalog in 1978, Rational Geomancy, The Kids of the Book Machine in 1992, it's a longer title, um, a manifesto and sampling of Canadian arts and writing. His scholarly works include um, Imagining Language with Jed Rosula in 1998, and prior to meaning um, the proto semantic and poetics in 2001. Steve McCaffrey. I'm going to break my own space again. I've always been attracted to Marshall Duchamp's notion of the Afro mass, the infra thin. And he gives a wonderful example of that. It's the, the shimmering warmth as the buttocks leave the seat. <laughs> <laughs> my head says stand, my knees say sit. Um, I'm going to be reading a little bit from certain words, uh, a small chapter, that actually interlaces four ongoing manuscripts. Um, let me just read them out rather than that. This chapbook is assembling from four ongoing longer manuscripts, Laptop Boulevard, a rewriting of Dante's Vita Nuova, Discontinued Meditations, a book of fractured thinking, Canterbury Tales of Alone with the Animals. The prose explications of some of the poems utilize a morph, Dante Gabriel Rossetti's translation of Dante's Vita and preserve his intended archaic phrasing. So, a couple of those again. Poor poems. Have you ever been read upon? Read upon in the same way that I am dying is grammatically the same as it is snowing. Dazzled we enter you through the image opposite. We appear to say we are here to wrap poems around your metaphors, down the hard edge of a magnitude, to take a breath of fresh air in the ethical trunk while the wide wobbles in your references. We walk backward into hermeneutic plans, discuss a day ago on the auxiliary blog and up to the chill realities they rest on. 
Trees depend on beauties, and a book is not a story. Words are too smart to let that happen. Alongside, a poet's face sets travels to cacophony, and Wordsworth's prelude speaks itself as 36,000 words in search of deletion. <laughs> the footnote wears an overcoat in which God defines himself as transcendental unemployment. It rings the mango, doesn't it? And that sure is its ring. Poems are really camouflaged around an endgame, predatory exemplar considered in reference to the transitive varieties known as extrema, invisible bridge mathematics hidden in the thick uh, think crypt, outward in the cold of earlier exterior ensemble aggregates that pose as grid gates over water stuttered in the nanotechnic just in case it forgets. So spy out the lambs before naming them is not a sentence written for, for dogs. Nothing is signaled. Cold, cheap words. Stone, tablet, Scheherazade, person A. Are you selling your pets off too? Person B. Only my extra colony of nematodes. The, uh, I'm keeping the parrot's body language for the peacock girl and her retinue of civil wars. Person A and Pegasus. It may become a broken anger if its wings are clipped. A long poem, perhaps, is still a fatal concept, given that there are two points of being on a trajectory of becoming. Recall a word is but a singular becoming, a space from now on in language where the self seeks a resting somewhere other than in itself. The boredom of snow, which always falls about your steps each time you write the word flake. And language greets its philosophical counterpart to make up the terms that each science steals away for each example. Can you think as far as simile allows you, and think while a metaphor is pushing facts into sub substitutions? Is this another way to write about writing? To write when outside an idea or as a subject with a different direction, one to whom relating phrases to neighborhoods by using mirrors for doors takes you back to where you started. The self, as it knows itself, is an ephemeral disguise, merely a habit of saying I. And Malraux offers to the theory of the lyric the concept of an I without a self, a poetic position of the personal without the laminating narratives of an ego, a phenomenal condition considered as bare life on the edge of language, experienced even prior to encounter as the inhuman. The inhumanity that is language formulates all discourses, human and post-human alike. This position excites a silent cry that, for lack of a better word, is called vision. It was heard by St. John of the Cross, Angelus Silesius, and possibly by Bruce Andrews. <laughs> Under the gravity of this lyrical metaphysics, we deposit Jean-Luc Nancy's sense of writing as excription and teleologically frame it as a quest for the golden apple of zero, the bite of which reveals that to taste nothing is to taste excess in abandonment. So give, up your time, uh, so give yourself time to stock up on those rubber sheets, as youth's never around when you need it. A psychosis in a shipyard witnesses the passing of the gay continuum, ignites its Puritan faggot eye, a matutinal percept at least, and peculiar to the ones who pro prolixity dripped into full drawback and falsified all the sex trafficking statistics. It was a complex epoch between the hot dogs without mustard and relish and the iPhone predicaments, subatomic realms of omniprobability made sure the trees arose as ordinary angels in a forest to be exhibited in the lost vitrines of Nazareth, and the sea had become a smooth space of specific problems in narrative. In the allegory down the block from the latest pharmaceutical conventions Autobiography admits itself to be one huge footprint. We'll go for a drink when I get off work with one improbable siren, two raisins for eyes, and tell her or it that the man from Ithaca sent us to remember that lunch in Little Tibet, perceiving a land of footprints in next week's rain. 
This poem has two principal parts. In the first, when I advise to stock up on rubber sheets, I mean to call such persons that are, persons that are aged in those words of Jeremiah the prophet, O vos omnis qui transitis per viam attendit et vidite si est dor sicut dor meus, which English reads, All ye that pass by, behold, and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, and pray then to stay and hear me. In the second part, I tell of the complexity of the, of the times, touched on same-sex same relations, as two of popular foodstuffs, modern devices, the town of our Lord, and glass display cases therein. I next speak a veiled reference to Odysseus, and end with a promise to a friend with whom I discuss our mission in life. The second part begins here. It was a complex epoch, which the last part of the poem shows, and I say where I have lost. A truly transdisciplinary materialist poetics needs to engage three theories of matter. One, informatics, in which matter becomes purely digitalized information, and information is embraced as sheer material. Two, biogenetics, where matter is the medium of a genetic code algorithm. Three, quantum physics, where matter is reduced to the collapse of the virtuality of wave oscillations. Four, relativity theory, where matter reduces to an effect of curved space. The concerted reduction of matter to void, what Zizek calls spectral materialism, helps to theorize semantic void in the work of Gertrude Stein and Clark Coolidge, for instance, where any anchoring in meaning is confounded by a corresponding loss of it. This, of course, is the pattern of a dissipative structure. Zizek. There is a way to conceptualize the emergence of something out of nothing in a materialist excess, but as a release, a loss of energy. One will be one. Two will be two. Three is three. But four is our friend. And our friend is F. Our F is first. First for four. First for fist, first for fit, and first for fur. Fur not far, fur far tree, not far from us. Fur not fur, fur tree true, fur tree not true. The contagion of the naked present caught in the stability of the phrase once I believed in, disseminated agitation in the transience others call death. Thank you. Michael Palmer has written more than half a dozen books of poetry, beginning with Blake's Newton in 1974. Critic Brigden Mullins notes his poetic is situated yet active and it affords a range of pleasure due to his wonderful ear, his intellection, his breath. In this century of the eye over the ear, Palmer's insistence on sound evokes a subtextual joy. In 2006, Palmer described the trajectory of his poetry as moving a little bit away from radical syntax into the mysteries of ordinary language, in the philosophical, if not everyday sense. It probably looks less usual on the page and says he's been interested in the infinite in general control of the lyrical phrase. Michael Palmer has translated work from French, Portuguese, and Russian and edited Nothing the Sun Could Not Explain, 20 contemporary Brazilian poets in 1997. He has also collaborated extensively with the Margaret Jenkins Dance Company and with visual artists and composers. Michael Palmer. Thank you so much, and thanks for the invitation to be here. My first reading of this long time. Um, I thought I would read some sections as time permits from a piece called um, elegy for Sister Satan. Um, 
I thought they were first elegy, second elegy, third elegy. Then I realized, no, if it's one elegy, I realized that this afternoon. So uh, we're changing a little bit. In any case, I'll read uh, some sections of it until my time runs out. Uh, I was thinking of Robert in relation to this because we always discussed uh, the serial poem and sequence and um, all those variations um, uh, that allow you to uh, um, dispose of the sense of to to the totalizing poem and allow it to play out in part. Um, so anyway, here's the first section. Singing is prohibited in this cafe. Torture is permitted in this cafe. I'll have a double thank you in three-quarter time, sister. May I call you sister? You, Amadine, unsmiling in this ever-changing light that cloaks the feral world. These dancers, do you know them? Do they think as they glide and spin of what is to be and what has been? Do they know, do you know their names? And if so, do their names change from earliest hours to late and day to day? Do their words, do their wounds show as they mimic the music's path? Sister, I apologize, but I must ask. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Abu Ghraib, Moradur, Terezin, Deir, Yassin, Veldiv, Forkuta, Magadan, that was, that dance, among the cafe candles and beyond the fogged windows, the endless alley of lightning-scarred trees whispering fractured words for none to understand. All the beautiful names, sister, the infinite names roll off the tongue, innumerable as the stars that frolic in the sea. Sister, is it not time for us to learn to speak now that the infernal machines have captured the breathing word? Now that drones fill the sky over Santiago de Chuco, Central Park, and Unter de Ninden, is it finally too late in this welcome winter rain to cross the singing bridge to that place <coughs> where memories of the future bend like cypress limbs under ancient snow, where the plague years melt away and the shrill voices of children explode from the mist with nothing but pain and praise to sing as if one and the same, like two bodies joined in a last embrace. And these cypresses, ministers of mourning, how is it we applaud them in their grace? Three. The clock is a fiction, dear sister, yet we live within it. Sister, its arms are ours, and the fiction is as real as a rose in the steel dust. And you will recall, dear sister, that each of us is the sum of the two preceding numbers in the talismanic series, and that this ever-expanding, radiant, and more than perfect spiral will swallow us, so said was it Zoroaster from a distant cliff, his spider arms outstretched on the face of a death's head clock. And it is there within the span of those arms that we recall what we were not. We were not what we thought to be and to become, not the architects of desire, not the thieves of fire, nor gardeners, nor plumbers, nor workers in steel, only the painted puppets of parallel lives, only the uninvited guests, ghosts at the beggar's banquet. Elegy for whom or for what? We watched the frothing tide gather time in, <clears throat> and it meant nothing at all to us then, or at most 
some spare thing that could be could not be freely said, a wound of salt laced water and a gasping mouthful of sand, while deaf to those measures which draw us together. Four. At last, the perfect weather is unending, even as the ice storms prove unending, even as what was once eternal departs like a brief smile, as we swing from life to life like sad-eyed clowns in white face and baggy pants, balancing on red balloons between the simultaneous worlds, the parallel worlds we have yet to name. Sister, did the lords of war once offer you a name? Was it the same one they offered me at the point of a gun? Did we then live on, telling unspeakable tales over a thousand and one unending nights? Lift the ice and the sun to your lips, sister, and to mine, and sing the words between the lines. Five. O oh body, where are you going in the fog of the body, in the mist of thought, in the body of another, known and not? O oh body, have you watched the Dioscuro dance as one body and two on the quantum tips of fire while an ensorcelled earth spins below? How many languages, how many limbs are scattered along the roads of this earth? How many sounds meeting their anti-sounds? How many books burning to light the way? How many pure believers to shatter the icons of the pure believers while the ensorcelled earth spins on a turtle's back? Our jaws churn to emit a song. They will return the body, return the body, dear silent earth gone where? Here, sister, it can be said that goodbye means hello, day, night, far, near, here, where the river, rivers run uphill, and the clouds lie still at your shadow, ghost sister, amidst an incendiary light. Sister, we have ridden the mute centaurs and firebirds round and round in the dark, and slowly learned to spell without words, gauge the ebbs and swells of the untellable tale. Praise the infinite, nameless tellers of tales, swaying from the poplar's limbs. The wind belongs to them. To us, the breath, the frayed thread, the turn and return of the juggler's stolen song. Nothing to know. Nothing to tell of the now and the then, after all. I see the world is mad, sings Kabir, who knew neither ink nor pen, as he wandered the islands of this earth, where up is ever down, and song has no sound. Seven. Again, we are ourselves no more. That's a quote from Nichita Stanisko. Our bodies, sisters, such as they are, almost touch, but transparent as they are, we pass through one another as if on the way elsewhere, on the way as if. Sister, I've lost the thread and need to begin again. For days, no words have come, none to say elsewhere, none to say body, None to say begin. Sister, I saw three children hanging from a tree, their slender bodies tilting in the breeze. Why three? Did poem or war or dream place them there? Mad poem, mad war, sober dream. I saw a house of ink dark glass and Minerva's owl flying backwards towards that city with a future never to be. It's there we learn those countless lessons about fall, nightfall, and the inner sky, 
it too falling, and the masters of doo-wop, techno and ska, of toro and dice throw, and the angel-winged messengers of utopia, their showers of light and open-tuned guitars, the green dancer in her flesh-clinging mist, Flora and Kiki and Madame X, glistening Ava, fading echo, and silently the anti-Icarus falling among the concrete cliffs, his welcoming arms outstretched. City of conjurers and crumbling gates, mute buskers and alphabets of flame, sister, your match perhaps that lit the paper path of names, list I found inside your eyelid that one brief afternoon, knowing no more where we begin or when we end. Thank you. books of um, Jerome Rothenberg's poetry that have been published, plays, <coughs> anthologies, many experimental works, uh, installations, and um, critical uh, work of, um, to me, illuminating uh, qualities. Um, Jerome Rothenberg has explored primitive and archaic poetry, sound poetry, found poetry, visual poetry, trans he's done translations and worked um, notably of uh, the huge and uh, very useful um, anthologies, poems for the millenniums of which we have now, um, I think more than three different volumes. Um, just to mention an um, introduction of Phil Rice made um, to a reading of um, Gerald Rothenberg. Uh, he has become the poet, critic, teacher, anthologist, translator, activist, art archivist, assembler, organizer, and editor that has done as much as anyone to make a radical modernism available to readers. Gerald Rothenberg. I, I will sit this time. I first met Robert Duncan in 1959. San Francisco was and remained his city, but he was then living in Stinson Beach, a short ways up the coast. We had been corresponding for maybe a year before that, although I was a dozen years younger and very little published. Berlin Getty City Lights was bringing out my first book, New Young German Poets, a book of translations, and that summer Diane and I had come to San Francisco for the first time. We ran into him at the City Lights bookstore. There was a kind of photo session going on, and a few days later, Diane and I drove to Stinson Beach, picking up Robert, who was hitchhiking somewhere along the way. <laughs> he was at that rare moment here. There are photographs to prove this. Um, as was Jess, and looked to my naive eye, a little bit like a 40-year-old Whitman. Jess then looked oddly like a youthful D.H. Lawrence. There was a feeling of enchantment about it all. Themselves, the house and garden, the books they read, the painting and the collages Jess was making, the grunion running that night along the shore, the meteorites that flashed across the night sky, all of this happening simultaneously, and a meal, Diana reminds me, uh, replete with uh, sorrow and lemons and colorful nasturtiums from their garden. I felt myself led by a kind of magic into a world suggested by his poem. Two years later, a poem titled The Counter Dances of Darkness, uh, not dedicated to Robert, beginning with a short quote from his prose, 
and I'll just read that uh, and uh, uh, the commentary that precedes a series of uh, poem poems. Robert Duncan from the Daybook. All life is oriented to the light from which life comes. The bees in their dances are oriented to the sun, and if it is dark, will dance in relation to a candle flame. The commentary. One. But that the bee could be seeking death oblivion was also clear, and would in some sense make that, dan that dance more fierce, more precious too. We noticed other movements as well, movements away from light, of the animals uh, who burrowed in our, uh, the animals who burrowed in our hill, uh, the night creatures softened by beams from my flashlight, the roots of all things curving back into earth's belly, the penis into the womb of the woman. Could light teach us the whole dance without the counter dance of darkness? Two. There is no light or darkness that in itself can orient us to where we become, but only a constant shift of planes between the two. Light and darkness, life and death, speech and silence, sight and blindness. The dark, wrote Lorca, wants to become light, but the Gabon pygmies told us, the light becomes darkness, the night and again the night, the day with hunger tomorrow. Three, both sides are made real, one not subordinated to the other, but as functions of a total movement born from, born from and productive of each other. If a child is born is no truer than that a man dies, and sometimes the distance between birth and death is no more than a moment, part of an hour at best. Yet the narrower dimensions of that child's life is no stranger than that our whole universe, whose limits move away from us at speech approaching the speed of light, will return someday to the undifferentiated mass of its first beginning, to a heavy and dark brilliance the size of Mar Mars's orbit. Had Lawrence envisioned this when he wrote, everything is meant to disappear, every curve plunges into the vortex and is lost, reemerges with a certain relief and takes to the open, and there is lost again. Between light and darkness, we wait, we dance, like the evening star he sang of, between the sun and the moon, and swayed by neither of them. The evening star that is seen at the dividing of the day and night, but then is more wonderful than evening. This next poem, uh, written shortly after Robert's death uh, and dedicated to him, uh, begins with a dream uh, in which he appears uh, to me. And I'll just read the first section. The poem goes on uh, a series of elegies for uh, George Oppen, for uh, Paul Blackburn, uh, yeah, for others. But the first section is the dream. I was given a poem in the dream, a poem I read out loud, where I could feel the words coming in bursts, but couldn't salvage them. I only knew the poem's name was Seedings, and that it followed after a performance of Cockboy, uh, in which I had to improvise the final lines, unable to remember what they were. Between poems, I made a comment about Duncan's peculiar way of reading, knowing he was dead, but seeing him sitting in the audience and nodding at me when I started reading. Now in the dream, I read aloud the poem of Seedings, like the time I saw you, and how it opens me to further words, new definitions, as I see you sitting there, old friend, alive, to hear my stammer like your own, that mark of poetry upon each poet's tongue, I call the listeners to hear in us while laughing, crying at some other poem I read before, obsessive words we all can nod our heads to, 
but I could not find the ending, not for all the years of reading it aloud and heard somebody say, not you, but somebody, time is the thief of language, meaning tongues, like that the cat gets hold of. <coughs> I did with theology for most of the Blackburn. But the leading tongue, like that the cat gets hold of it. The cat is dead for the thief of language, meaning tongues. Enough to construct the mythos on at last. Old male cat comes in through his window to talk to him, or it finds him voiceless, waving kindly to my son who stands outside. I Paul. The tape is turning, sends my own voice back to me. He must have placed with care there on the reel to mark our visit. And this was 20 years ago, and more now, a time that cat could, no cat could possibly survive, during which time the deaths have come increasingly, reality by that thrown back into the cat's mind where all reality resides till death disrupts it and erases world and time at once. Your time and mine, Paul, as it erases words, stares out at you so big it trembles on your screen, ascends your vertebrae, gone into dust by now, poor spook, our voices on the tape, already gone for you, although you labor to engrave it, lugging that big old box around from real to real, to still more real, when there was a world to live in, and the word, words to know it by quickly came into mind and hand. Remember? No. There is no memory among the dead, and even when you write them down, it isn't I who speak these words, but you, and only for a time. And uh, when I wrote the poem, uh, one poem, uh, called Hurban, Yiddish Hebrew word for uh, Holocaust, in, uh, in written shortly after Robert's death, uh, I dedicated it to him. I, I, I don't know if the dedication went on in, in, in all versions of the poem. Uh, to Robert Duncan, now be the angel of my poem. And I'll finish with your names. In the dark word, Horman, all their lights went out. Their words were silences, memories drifting along the horse roads onto Mount Peter Street. The disaster of the mother's tongue, her words emptied by speaking, returning to a single word, the child word spoken red-eyed on the frozen pond, was how they spoke it, how I would take it from your voice, craving an ancient and dark word, those who spoke it in the old days, now held their tongues. Thus isolated. At Honey Street in Austria, where did the honey people go? <coughs> empty, empty, Miodova empty, empty bakery, empty roads of Warsaw, yellow wooden houses and houses plastered up with stucco, the shadow of an empty name still on their door, shall die in shadow, shattering the mother's tongue, the mother's tongue, but empty the way the streets are empty. When we walk pushing past crowds of children, old women airing themselves outside the city hall, old farmers riding empty carts down empty roads. We go to spell and make an emptiness a taste of empty honey. Empty rolls you push your fingers through, empty sorrow soup dripping from their empty mouths, defining some other Poland lost to us the way the moon is lost to us. Sorrow in the gardens, mother of God in roadsides, in the reflection of the empty trains, only the cattle bellowing. Like Jews, the do I wander is still present. Still the flies cover their eyeballs, the trains drive eastward, falling down a hole, a holocaust of empty houses, with empty ladders leaning against haystacks, no one climbs. Empty Osterwald, empty Osterlenka, old houses empty in the woods near Vishkov, dachas the peasants would rent to you, and sleep in stables of the yellow forest spreading to every side. Retreating the closer we come to it to claim it. Empty oaks and empty fir trees. A man in an empty ditch who reads a book the way the Jews once read in the cold Polish light. The fathers sat there too, the mothers posed at the wood's edge. The road led brightly to Treblinka and other towns. Beaches that broke along the boog. Marshes with cattails, cows tied to trees. 
past witch that goes to war, that goes to refuse to walk tomorrow in empty fields of Poland, still cold against their feet, and empty pump black water drips from before a hill of ice. The porters will dissolve with burning sticks. They will find the babe's face at the bottom, invisible and frozen, and printed in the bottom. Circumambulation, 
which I suppose, which supposes a center which cannot be found. I am asking certain voices which seem to fall from on high and which are not mine that I can recognize lodged into my ears from the side as it were, although there are no walls asking the voices whether they know of any center to this floor. And they answer me in certain tongues which although I know a good many tongues and those among the most ancient of tongues, I know not the provenience of these. Dictation. Even the machine I type on is singing tonight with a siren hum, trying to drown out the voices. It is clear that I will have to inhabit this might-be room a long time before the center, if there is one, is revealed. We have a compost of exasperated dissent in the place where the fresh leaves should be and which will see no leaves until next spring. Break the rhythm is the next instruction. Manipulate the underhand, or more correctly, the underfoot I stretch up to no purpose. They shall say to me, I know that my voice is a singing one and that I run the cicada's blood. If this were the place for sources, I would argue that no specific blood runs in these veins. I will have no Chinas here, nor Tibets, nor Guatemalas, nor Egypts, and I give up the beautiful scarves falling into the sea as slowly as the years of my life falling down this trench of what I am to be. Even in speaking of them, singing of them as I do here, I give them up. They have not before this provided the clue to the presence of the center, thus I deem them useless. The only odyssey I know is the rain from the high sky to the low via a multitude of intermediate skies, losing color as it comes down, turning transparent, losing its voices even, becoming very silent as it touches earth briefly as in an acquaintance's kiss. On the leaves it makes little noise, but only a little. I know of men who are in love with machines, talking machines and singing machines and even silent machines. They are the kings of the moment. And besides my <coughs> ignorance, their ignorance is like a golden knowledge. <coughs> if this could be an inhabitation, if this could be like the dead coming to life again and having affairs with me between the sheets, I would say yes. If my friends could come down from their portraits arranged against this wall and inform me of their actions, of the joy in their writing, the midnight hours burning in splendor around their heads, and they were saying things that would lead me towards the center of this fall, I would say yes. If their souls could come out of their bodies, out of their mouths and ears, let us suppose, or out of their navels, or even out of their cocks and cunts, and say what makes the pupils round their irises color of gold a certain moment in the dusk, then yes, it is not as if we had no time for miracles. This boat I lie in, like the sun on the sea going down into death, this boat floating on the floor of the ocean, a thousand fathoms below this floor, and the whole world away from my two ears, the whole extent of it still declares little. There is a hole in my tongue, in its center. There are many holes in my mind. My mind is like a sieve. The soup, which is to keep me alive today, falls through my tongue. I have no nourishment. I bring my right hand up to my mouth and speak as if in the sides to the other side, the sides from which the voices come, but it can be the two sides, confusion. We shall have confusion here, whether we wish it or not. The smoke rises into my eyes. It is the only thing to rise in the whole poem. I shall go to my dear one upstairs and tell her I carry her happiness in my voice as I would carry corn to broadcast. To scatter seed in this fall of the year is foolish, yet we scatter.
the snow will come down, winter, or perhaps there will be a carpet of sunlight on the naked ground. There may be mist over the river where I live, a fishing boat in which I lie and dream. Sufficient be it to take the gold into the house now, to express it in the form of a green plant. The green plant on my desk before me is a Swedish ivy. It grows like riot. I will give you tea at this table, or coffee, or wine. I will cook for you at this table and entertain you with mirth and conversation. You will tell me of times gone and to come. You will have no voice, but it be peripheral. Certainly you will not bring me news of the hidden kingdom in the center of the floor. There's a great deal of love in our relationship. I will weigh your scholars in the palm of my hand, saying they correspond to this or that knowledge. I have accumulated over the years, and I will tell you whether their books are true or false. But of the floor, I will not say a word, and you will be unable to, likewise. <laughs> Je suis en France, je suis né ici et je veux faire une toute petite chose française. Alors, je vais lire de, euh, une traduction de Serge Faucheron. Il y a très longtemps de ça, euh, Duncan Passages et Structures, euh, publié par Bourgois en 1977. Donc, en fait, un an après, après ça. And it's from Caesar's Gate. La deuxième nuit de la semaine, à présent me voici à la porte de César. Et là, l'esprit rageur, hélas, qui tourne en rond, comme tourne une bête dans sa cage, dit « Pense au sens de ma rage. »« Par qui jures-tu que tu reviens à cet endroit ?»« Me voici à la porte, las. Las comme l'Asie, aussi rageur, éveillé, que s'il ne devait plus y avoir à présent le sommeil, le sommeil étant un secret de cet endroit. Ô oh, Alexandre, ô oh, conquérant des terres arides. <rires> Thank <laughs> you.